are living longer due to medical procedures and things, but are we living better than our grandparents or not? No, I think uh, what we're doing well is in my conventional training, I was trained to prescribe medicines and to refer for procedures. And, and, and yes, if it wasn't for certain medicines, um, if you don't have insulin, uh, you probably not gonna live very long if you're a type one diabetic and not too long as a type two as well. So we, knew, we need technology and we can go in and unclog an artery and do things like that. The question is, why are so many people getting all these medical conditions? And I would argue, uh, if we listen to our ancestors, they did things better. They certainly didn't eat as often. So we have access to technology, but we also have access to food. And so I can go outside and probably any time of the day and go to a fast food place. So eating multiple times throughout the day is probably not the best thing. Our ancestors fasted as a general rule. They, they probably ate once a day, maybe twice a day. And we eat three times a day plus snacks in between. So, uh, and then they ate seasonally. So although I tend to eat berries as a low carb uh, doc, um, you know, maybe I would eat seasonally and that would be okay because I would only be able to eat fruit certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. And they were naturally eating less fruit and less sugary fruit like a banana or a grape just because they ate seasonally. So I think we can learn a lot from our ancestors. And if we keep things simple and, and reflect in that way, I think we'll, we'll eliminate processed food because our ancestors didn't have access to processed food. Yeah, that's a great point. That's yeah. a really great point. And I, you've probably experienced, um, and I'm, I'm sure you have, uh, when you suggest to patients the idea of the, that there might be, a, that there certainly are a lot of science-based benefits of eating less carbs and eating a higher healthy fat uh, type of, uh, type of, of lifestyle. Um, what are some of the common questions that, uh, that you get? Do, you ever, do people ever ask you, hey, Dr. Tony, isn't that going to clog my arteries and, yeah. uh, you know, cause yeah. heart disease? Yes, um, and I, I don't really, uh, it doesn't surprise me because I had the same question. I, I spent my entire career being told that saturated fat will clog my arteries. So how am I then to say it's not going to do that? And sure. I had to do my own personal research. Um, to figure this out. So the, one of the examples that I like to give my patients, because so many people suffer from hypertension. Yes. So a lot of times uh, people think, well, I don't want to, you know, have a heart attack or, you know, and I say to them, well, your even your blood pressure is not about eating more fat. It's about eating less sugar and starch. It's about inflammation. So the example I give is when you have inflammation in your body, primarily from sugar, starch, and excessive grains. It, when I say grains, they look at me like a deer's in the headlight. But, but what I say is that they're inflammatory. So an inflammation in your arteries can then make your artery uh, not produce something called nitric oxide. Most people know what nitric oxide is because they think about nitroglycerin, which we put under our tongue if we're having chest pain, wow. right? Every, pretty much people know about that. So but imagine your body makes nit nitric oxide or nitroglycerin itself. And then that causes vasodilation. It causes your arteries to expand. So number one, if you have a less inflammation because you're not eating the sugar and starch, then your artery will expand. So even if you eat salt, which causes more fluid to come into your artery, because wherever uh, salt goes, water goes, it'll expand. So it doesn't matter. Number two, that inflammation in the artery will uh, require, your cholesterol is a good thing because this job is to repair. So it's gonna go in there and try to tuck point, just like your house, it's gonna tuck point your house if you have a brick house. Now, guess what? If, it, if there's a lot of inflammation because you're eating a lot of sugar, starch, and grains, instead of tuck pointing your house, it'll plaster it. So now you have a stucco house and that's the equivalent of uh, cholesterol plaques clogging your arteries. So. So we blame the salt, which is not really the problem. We blame the cholesterol, which is trying to repair your house or your arteries. But the real problem is the inflammation and the root cause of that is the sugar, starch, and I would say excessive 
and the grains. So once you cut back on those things, the inflammation goes away and now you've eliminated the root cause. So a guy like me who eats low carb, sometimes I have to put, even though it's his coffee here, sometimes I have to put a little salt, uh, of course, pink Himalayan salt in my uh, first glass of water or whatever, because my body naturally gets rid of salt. People who eat a lot of starchy foods, carbohydrates, hydrate attracts salt and water. And what happens is now you have to reduce your salt because you're attracting it with your diet. The way I eat, I actually have to add salt. So salt's never been the enemy. Cholesterol's never been the enemy. <clears throat> the enemy's been sugar, uh, this, uh, not the sugar, but the, yeah, the sugar and starch. So, so once we start to think differently about this, and I share this with my patients, then they're not afraid of those things that they were once afraid of. Uh, and then I shift their, their, their blame to other things. And, and, and again, it doesn't mean that I'll, I'll never eat sweet potato pie. It just means that I become metabolically healthy first. And then if I want to cheat every once in a while, it's no big deal. So it's about understanding how, how it's all about root cause. And everything that I do in my teaching says, you know, somebody comes in with heartburn, I say, well, why do you have heartburn? I don't just give them a pill. I say, well, let's figure yeah. out. And sometimes because they got a, a large belly that's pressing on their stomach, which is making their uh, lower esophageal sphincter, that valve between your, uh, you know, their throat and your stomach. Yeah. Because, yeah. So if you, yeah. And if you just literally, uh, if it's a balloon, if you squeeze a balloon, the top part of the balloon, the bottom is going to open up. So that's that valve opening up. Yeah. So you and that the then causes that's reflux. That's reflux. And so it's not, so once, so almost all my patients who lose belly fat, their heartburn goes away. It's more, it's almost like a structural anatomical problem, but we call it an acid problem. It's not an acid, it's an acid problem because the acid made your throat sore. But the reason why it was sore because you have uh, maybe belly fat pressing on there. And then once you get rid of that, everything kind of returns to normal for a lot of patients. Wow. Almost all my patients, really almost all, and it, it's an easy thing to visualize. Just think of the balloon when you push yeah, the balloon. Yeah, yeah, that's a, you're a great teacher. Sir. Yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like the, it, you squeeze the balloon down here and then it's going to open up that valve. So the acid is going to come up. So all we do is get rid of the, we don't push that, push on that uh, stomach anymore. It's amazing. I, it's almost shocking. Half the stuff gets better. People are, they come to me for weight loss and then they come back and say, yeah, my reflux is gone. My erectile dysfunction is better. All this stuff gets better as a side effect. Oh and yeah. Like, they yeah. weren't looking for it, but they're, they're certainly thankful. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, there's so many, so many uh, as you were saying, looking upstream at, for the causes instead of just treating the symptoms. That's, a, that's a fundamentally a great, you know, right way to start with anybody. So absolutely, talk to you for for treating your patients like that, and that, and and also just for anyone out there who's who's maybe new to this world, there are more and more MDs out there like Dr. Tony who are getting on this bandwagon of treating the root causes and the whole field of functional medicine. That's mm -hmm. one of the one of the areas. I mean, there's probably other names, and uh, but uh, there's. I mean, I literally have on my Twitter, I probably have at least a hundred, you know, I personally know a hundred docs who are into this. Yeah. I'm sure there are probably thousands. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, a uh, diet doctor has the low carb resources. I think the functional medicine, um, uh, I would just search that. Um, and I'm actually studying nutrition and functional medicine at University of Western States right now. And, and it did provide uh, a different perspective on Western trained. Uh, and, and it's not that either is better or worse. It's just, let's integrate both ways of thinking. Yeah, yeah, the if a person needs surgery, they're going to get surgery, you know? I mean, right, exactly. Yeah. You've got you more know. tools in your toolbox. That's so. all it is. More tools. Yeah. And then just a different way of looking at the world. You're never satisfied with a pill. You're, you're always looking for why. Is there a way to reverse this or cure this? That's a different mindset than managing disease eternally on medicine. So yeah. we're just trying to shift it. Yeah, I, it makes, I have to bring this up. I, someone sent me, uh, actually yesterday, an old video of Chris Rock. Uh, this, it was probably over 10 years ago. It was just getting started. And he's got, he's got this, the routine where he's talking about uh, um, the, he was talking, actually he was talking about uh, Another disease. He was talking about AIDS way back in the day, 
and, and he was making the point that, uh, that you know, that the, there's, no, there's no money in a cure. The money's in the medicine. Right. And, uh, you know, so, of course, yeah. you know, <laughs> was really, he, he says it a lot funnier than I did. Well, he's close. brilliant. <laughs> but, even, but even Chris Rock will tell you that his humor is not uh, something that is natural. He earns it. So yeah. even as a person who's listening to this, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to earn it. But it's the, the funny part is, it's just Chris Rock would say, I just, it's a little, it's a little bites of the elephant every day. So by watching this today, you're taking a bite off the elephant. You're going to learn something today that maybe you didn't know. It may be one term or one thought. And then next tomorrow, you're going to take another bite off the elephant. So what he does is he practices his craft and he goes to the small venues and tests his comedy in the small places first. And then he, but, but he spent hours, hours practicing and writing and thinking and, 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 and you're going to do the same thing for your health. And what more, what's more important than your longevity? What's more important than that? So why not spend a little, just 15 minutes in a day? what a small investment to be here for your family longer. So, so I, I heard him interview once and he just talked about, my humor is not by accident. You know, it's, it's yeah. not, it's, it, he earned that. And that's why he's one of the funniest comedians on the planet. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. There's, uh, I actually had in my, in the business coaching group I told you about earlier, um, there's a gentleman who is a, who's a copywriter, um, marketing copywriter guy. And he was a comedian, he still is a comedian as a hobby, but he was a, a full-time professional comedian for 10 years. And he was telling us about, you know, traveling to these small clubs around the country, you know, right. and, and it's just grueling, you know. It's grueling. And, you know, just like, a, and a, he was saying, you know, he said, gosh, I, he said the only thing harder would probably be, you know, working, you know, when you're doing your internships and, and yeah. your, your night shifts at the, I don't know if you've done if you've done ER. Uh, like, you know, yeah, it's brutal. It's got to be brutal, you know. Yeah. It's got to be brutal. So yeah, you don't want to know. And, and yeah, the stuff I experienced in the ER in Chicago at Mount Sinai Hospital every, literally every day, somebody was shot or stabbed. Yeah. And what people don't know is that half that stuff don't even make the news. Yeah. Because it's too many. So so yeah, I, I learned a ton in that setting, but it's grueling. The hours are long, and you have new laws to protect the docs, but it's still a lot of hard work. Well, speaking of, I remember, you know, in, in our, we've, we've talked before, and it, uh, I'm trying to remember some, some nuggets from that. Uh, so before I forget, as a, as a doctor who's able to, who's been able to, you know, your metabolic engine, you know, people think, oh, well, I have to have, people say to me, you know, well, Dan, I have to have sugar for my brain. I have yeah. to have carbs for my brain. You know, I'm going to, my brain's not going to work if I don't eat carbs. So as a doctor, how, 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 can, how do you address that? Well, I think what we have to understand is that um, there's only um, two essential macronutrients. So when we think about macronutrients, we think about uh, you know, amino acids, protein, and, uh, and the protein turns into broken down into amino acids. And we think about fat breaking down into fatty acids. Uh, the only thing left is carbs, but they're not an essential nutrient. So the Mansa tribe in Kenya uh, is a well-studied tribe and they eat the, uh, I think it's a buffalo, the blood and the milk of the buffalo. That's all they eat. And it may vary periodically, but, but the reason why they can get away with that is because you will get um, energy from fat. You will get energy from your protein. And so the reason why you don't really need uh, the uh, carbs is because your body uh, stores energy in the form of glycogen. So glycolysis uh, is a breakdown of glycogen. And, um, and glycogen is almost like the opposite of the uh, insulin uh, or, or, yeah, so, um, yeah. But so what happens is, and you also have something called gluconeogenesis, and you're able to form, uh, you know, uh, energy from amino acids and things like that. So, so I guess my point is, 
you really want to be able to understand that the body is very smart. When you're sleeping at night, you're able to um, have energy. And the question is, you're not eating. So where does that energy come from? And so you have all of these mechanisms occurring in your body where you can convert the uh, protein into a form of sugar. So there's no need to uh, feel like you have to have it. Now, the brain will run on ketones itself. And so you can actually run on ketones as a form of uh, energy. And you do need some glu glucose, right? You need a little glucose, probably at least 30%, but you can get that because your body knows how to convert the protein into glucose as well. So, 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 it's, it's, so it is true to say that you need glucose to run your brain and your body, but you don't have to get it. We use the term exogenously. You don't have to get it from outside the body. Okay. Your body will do it. On its, it'll convert the protein into a form of glucose for you. So you never have to. That's why those tribes that don't eat any carbs, they do just fine. And, and if you look at those, if anybody Googles the Mansa tribe, I think it's M-A-S-S-A-I, something like that. But if you Google that tribe and look at them, there nobody looks like they have an obesity problem. I mean, they look like uh, literally body, <laughs> you know, they're like, so, so there's no obesity problem there. So I think the key is once we understand how the body works and, and you know, how do carnivores uh, walk around? You think about Dr. Ken Berry, you think about uh, Sean Baker. Well, Sean uh, Baker. Baker is like a... The, guys, the guy looks like an NFL linebacker. Exactly. So, so how is it that he can only eat meat and doesn't he need glucose? Well, his, his protein is converted to glucose. So, so I think it's important that we, uh, you know, use a little common sense first. And then beyond that, say, okay, uh, I've heard that you need glucose. Well, where's it? So when, you, when people make statements, you always have to dig a little deeper. Again, root, get to the roots. And the root says, well, there's got to be some other form of glucose. If, that, if it's a true statement that you need it, how are you getting it if you're not consuming it? And the, and the answer is your body will make it for you. Right. Okay. So, so could, to, to put a, a sound bite on this, could we say that our, that our metabolic engine uh, in our, you know, that comes factory installed in our body is like a hybrid engine in a car that it can, it can work I, with? I, I love that uh, analogy because exactly. So uh, we use the language of being fat or keto adaptive. And, and, what, and basically all we're saying is we, we all are capable of using fat as fuel, ketones as fuel. Uh, but when you become metabolically adaptive, that means you're more efficient. So when your uh, car, the engine of your body is not just accustomed to burning uh, one type of fuel, but you adapt it to burning a second type of fuel. So now you can burn glucose and you can burn fat what happens is you're just more efficient. So you never worry about uh, when you're driving down, you know, I live in Chicago, Illinois, and my, a lot of my family lives in the South. So it's about a 10 to 15 hour drive. When you become fat adaptive, you never have to stop the car for gas because most people only use the sugar starch and things like that as fuel. Well, when you become fat adaptive, now you're using the belly fat. So you really don't have to stop. You don't have to stop for fuel because it's sitting right there. It's just like the fuel tanker. Why would you have a big fuel tanker and you have this little gas tank? That's your sugar and starch. But, but you got the, all this gas. So instead of you, so why would you keep using the fuel tank when you got all this fuel on yeah. the fuel tanker? It's, that's your human body. So let's start using that, 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 that big tank. And, that, and, you, and the fuel tanker will never, he can travel the country multiple times with that much gas, right? So that's what we're trying to train our body. And that's why what you're saying is important. Let's become uh, like a, a well-run hybrid car that can use both sources of fuel. Okay, that's, I love that. That's, uh, that's that, in fact, we should, that could be the cover of a book. We have a <laughs> right. hybrid car. That's Your right. Your body is like the hybrid car. That's the right. engine. And uh, I used to use that, um, that example before I knew what low carb was, uh, back in the day when I started, 1989 is when I graduated with a health science degree, and, and I loved teaching this idea. But we were still talking about, you know, elevating your metabolism and eating, you know, 
five to six times a day, small meals, and there was this, you know, minor, you know, bit of research about that. And uh, so people still will ask me that too. They'll say, well, well, don't I need to eat more often to, to, to boost my metabolism? And how can you only eat once or twice a day and burn fat? You know, so. Yeah. Well, it's not. Yeah, I, I, I felt the same way. And that's why, again, I understand why people struggle with these concepts, because I, I was taught that small, frequent meals would be good for my diabetics, right? And yes. then I realized that small, frequent meals would lead to small, frequent insulin spikes. And yes. they're kind of chasing their tail. So, so we don't want to um, think about, that's just kind of like the nonsense of too many insulin spikes when it comes to metabolism you will increase your metabolism when you have to burn fuel so if you have to burn food you will in that moment increase your metabolism what people forget is that you just ate food so you may increase your metabolism a little bit in that moment but then you have to burn that food so by the time when they look at studies by the time you look at it you really haven't gained anything you know, you've eaten, so you have to process that in you. And then what they found, what, what's better for increasing metabolism, which doesn't make any sense in a way, is intermittent fasting. So when you reduce calories, you will slow your metabolic rate over time when you just chronically reduce your uh, calorie consumption. But when you intermittently fast, you actually increase your metabolic rate, which is kind of a paradox, but it's just how the body works. So, so the key is... Again, um, let's not um, keep stressing our body by constantly having to eat, constantly having to digest food, constantly having to have insulin spikes. Let's rest our body. I probably won't eat today until after I finish speaking at this church. I probably won't eat today until one o'clock. But, but my, I'm, I'm using my fuel tanker right now, right? I do have something I'm drinking, but it's black coffee. I may have some water, but my fuel tanker fuel is what I'm going to use for energy. I'm going to have more mental clarity. I'm going to feel better. And I don't have to keep doing all those little insulin spikes and these frequent small. And my metabolic rate is fine. So, um, so I think the key is to understand, again, how things work. And then by doing that, we can move towards uh, a more logical approach. And absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Tony, I've got a couple more of the, these myths and, and common questions I'll throw at you. So here's another one. Um, you know, people will say, well, hey, um, Dr. Tony, is eating low carb bad for exercise? I mean, don't all the pro athletes eat high carb? Yeah, you know, um, a lot of the athletes ate pro, uh, pro carb until they, some of them got sick. So some <laughs> of them, right. I mean, well, I, think, I think it's low carb now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know Serena Williams was for a while. Listen, um, Tim Noakes was a big time marathoner, marathoner in uh, South Africa, and he was uh, carb loading and uh, doing all of that. And he was a, a athlete. I mean, he and he wasn't unsuccessful at that. However. Uh, he started looking at his metabolic profile and all of a sudden he became, you know, borderline diabetic. And he was like, wait a minute, I'm becoming diabetic. And um, so, so I think that um, this idea that we have to carb low. Now, if I'm a sprinter, would it be helpful to have a little extra quick energy in that moment? Sure, probably would be. If I'm a, you know, but, 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 but do I, is that the only source of fuel? And the answer is no. So we have to be responsible with our body. And what happens is if I go, even going back to that uh, analogy with the fuel tanker, if I'm a, a marathon runner, would it make sense for me to have this big source of fuel that I can use to do that long marathon? Or would I want to keep putting on, keep having to re-tank the uh, small fuel tank? So I think that uh, this idea that I have to use uh, glucose as an athlete is not true. Now, are there benefits of having, when you're trying to build muscle uh, and you're trying to sometimes having a little carbohydrate that you ingest and then you kind of, you know, use it to fill those uh, muscles. That's not a, that's not something that doesn't make sense. That does make sense, but, but, the, but you can certainly do it 
without having the negative metabolic, uh, I'll call it, um, it's almost like a factory. So our mitochondria can use glucose as a source of fuel and it can also use uh, ketones. And what happens is when we use, when we overuse starch sugar uh, as a source of fuel to make energy in our mitochondria, which is the fuel factories for our body, it's, it's pretty dirty. It has a lot of byproducts that occur and all those byproducts cause damage. Um, when you use ketones, it's more like a solar panel and there's not a lot of byproducts. And in fact, it makes me think of that term autophagy. Um, yeah, I love that word. Know, and uh, it's been like a buzzword, right? Yeah, I think people maybe have heard of the, some people have heard that word, but I don't yeah. think it gets, it's, uh, um, and before we, before we go there, um, yeah. just, just a perspective, um, you know, because for any, for people out there who are thinking, you know, what the heck are these guys talking about? Are you guys, you know, nuts, you know, <laughs> so, cause, because, you know, I have it in my own family. I mean, I have, and, and I have, you know, people with PhDs who, who, you know, are real smart people, quote unquote, on the one side, uh, in their area, but they know, but they're, they, they would think anything new about nutrition or health is, is got to be, it must be something, you know, must be crazy and must be, you know. And so here's the thing. If we go back to 1920, the mainstream uh, acceptance of things like, you know, uh, like cars, people didn't have, you know, you didn't have cars generally in the mainstream. You didn't have dishwashers. You didn't have washing machines. Um, and now if we go back to medical science, uh, we could go back to the 1850s. It was not accepted that washing one's hands before, you know, before you, yeah. you know the story of, of this Hungarian doctor, scientist, right. uh, I think his name was Semmel Weiss. Right. And, uh, the poor guy, he studied this. Uh, he was studying uh, the, the idea. He, was, he wanted to look at why certain ba- you know, a lot of babies were dying after being, and with, with doctors, whereas the midwives, uh, who were also working in the hospital, the rate of death uh, was much lower. And what he That's finally right. figured out was, is that the doctors were doing the autopsies. That's and right. Going back to the, to, to, to the get to helping the mother give birth and without washing their hands because no one knew about that. And That's right. the poor guy ended up going to an asylum. So anyway, I think wow. about everything Dr. Tony is saying is scientifically proven and validated. It's just not really in the mainstream necessarily yet. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. So tell us more about autophagy, Dr. Dr. Tony. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, when you think about that term, you just want to keep it simple because I just consider it uh, cleaning things out. It's like you have uh, cellular debris um, because when you're, you know, your cells are going to get older and your cells have to, uh, complete those mitochondrial processes that create energy. So there's a lot of debris being created. And so autophagy is partly your body's way of removing that debris. And I remember having uh, Amy Berger on my podcast, and she talked about uh, the, her book, The Alzheimer's Antidote. And, and what she described, as we talked about dementia, as uh, type three diabetes, ironically, um, it's a we have a, a, a issue where some of that debris is not being removed. And by the way, a lot of people with dementia don't get enough; uh, they can't sleep well, uh, or they couldn't sleep well before they developed it. And part of, part of the problem with that is that some of the brain debris is removed when you're sleeping. So if you don't sleep well, you don't get rid of that debris. But, but also there's proteins in your brain uh, called amyloid, which are normally part of your brain, but we remove it. So if you don't do a good job of removing that debris, you're gonna run into trouble. So, and those amyloid plaques build up and clog up the brain. But the bottom line is, if we are able to do things that increase our ability to remove cellular debris, remove cells that are aging and not useful anymore, replace them with new cells, then we have a path to uh, reducing our risk for things like dementia. Uh, You could imagine old cells are more likely to turn into cancer. So now we have fresh cells, 
So now we can reduce our risk for cancer. Um, and, and, and I think that, so learning new terms like autophagy is really helpful. And then you, then you say, well, if that's what it is, then how can I improve it? Well, one of the things you can do is when you eat a, uh, a low carb, high fat diet, a ketogenic diet, you uh, accelerate that a little bit. Uh, when you intermittently fast, um, you accelerate that a little bit. You're going to be doing it 24 seven anyway, because your body's constantly removing debris. But what you're trying to do is optimize your body. Like we're not waiting to get sick. What we're trying to do is create a body, especially during a pandemic. You know, yes. we're, you know, we're recording this during COVID pandemic. So how do I optimize my body so that if I'm faced with a virus, my body is going to look at that virus and say, I don't like you being here, but I got, I got something I can do to attack you. So what you're doing is let's optimize our body. So we're going to maybe eat less starch and sugar. We're going to maybe consider intermittent fasting and even exercise will improve your ability to use that autophagy concept. So, and, and what you do is you look at where you have gaps and then you say to yourself, I'm not exercising. So what you do is you say, well, can I dedicate 10 to 15 minutes every other day to exercise? And, and, and since we're social distancing, maybe we do that at home. And who, I mean, it's a push up, a squat, a lunge. I mean, if you're not able to do that, you can do chair exercises. The key is, can I check the box that said exercise today? Can I check the box that said, um, I mean, I do what Dr. Hampton's going to do and I don't eat until two today. Uh, but maybe I'll, I normally eat at seven. Can I stretch that out to nine? And then maybe a few weeks later, can I stretch that out to 10 and not put any shirts? Like you just, you just, you just check a box. I'm doing better with reducing carbs. I'm, I'm stretching out when I eat. There's a bigger, there's a smaller, smaller eating window. I, I did do some form of exercise. You'll be shocked when I wrote my Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes book, you'll be shocked that all I did for about six months is I spent 30 minutes in the morning. I got up 30 minutes earlier and I just wrote for 30 minutes. That's it. And then yeah. I never, I didn't edit anything. I just wrote. And then I said, I'll do that later. And then it just turned into a book. It yeah. was 30 minutes a day. That's oh, it. Yeah. yeah it's, so, it's awesome. so it's all about biting little pieces of that elephant. Yeah, that's, that's the... This, this is part of what I teach my coaching clients too with the, the tiny habits idea. It's been a lot of folks have talked about it. I studied some work from a Stanford psychologist who basically, same thing. Um, in fact, uh, when I did, when I was doing that work, uh, one of the examples he gave was a, another Stanford uh, colleague of his had a rule who also has written a number, a bunch of books. Um, and his rule was one sentence a day, yeah. one sentence a day. And that was it. That's all that he, it. Even if he went out, he said, even if it was Christmas holidays and he'd been out to dinner and, you know, cocktails, and he'd sit down and write one sentence, just one sentence. Wow. And uh, so I, I do some of the same things with, with exercise. So I take non-exercisers and say, look, we're not going to, I'm not going to ask you to go buy a spinning bike. You don't need a spinning bike. You that's don't right. No, necessarily. You know, that's all great if you, you know, I like that stuff myself, but you don't need it. Uh, your human body can be a gym. You that's can good. do, uh, and even if you're sitting in a chair. So we sit in the chair and we take a, we take a water bottle or we take yeah. a soup can, you know? <laughs> yeah. So we do anything, you know, we do one, we do one minute a day to start. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it works. Like you don't, have to uh people some people do high intensity interval training and they only spend you know a short amount of time the key is to check the box you do not have to be on a, a wheaties box you know yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. wheaties box. all you need is to i did do a little bit today and and the thing is the people in general are not doing much of anything so if you can just do that you'll be ahead of most people um and your body will reward you for that. You'll have more energy. Uh, you'll feel better. You're less likely to fall and uh, break your hip if you're older because you have strong quads because you've been using them. Most uh, accidents for older adults is because their muscles have been shrinking. They're social distancing. They're not doing anything. 
and then they still end up sick. They're worried about COVID, but then they crack their hip because they're afraid to be out. They're afraid to move. And, and most of these things we can do at home. And by the way, if you're, if you're out walking around and nobody's around you, I'm not sure you need a mask on. You know, it's like you just have to use a little common sense. If you're not around people, uh, COVID's not just floating around the air. You got to be around human beings, organisms <laughs> that can yes. spread it. So we want to be careful not to be paranoid. But, but you should always have a mask just in case you see a crowd coming. Uh, but if you're just walking by yourself or your significant other, you can still do these things. You just have to be smart. And um, I started jogging, uh, which I didn't do historically because I wanted to be out and get some nature. And yeah. I just keep a mask with me, but rarely did I have to put it on because I was jogging in a fairly secluded area. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That's uh, something to keep in mind. But, and we, we talked in our earlier conversation about metabolic disease and some of the, the multiple facets of that. And, yeah. and uh, I think a lot, a lot of people don't really, they've heard that term, but they don't really know, you know what's under that umbrella of metabolic right. disease and how can we, and, and does uh, what we've talked about, does it have any effect on, you know, on somebody who's maybe who has a family history of metabolic disease, maybe they've got hypertension, maybe they've got some weight issues in their, you know, in their family. Um, how does, how does what we, you know, what, how does a low carb, healthy, low carb, healthy, higher fat eating affect metabolic disease? Yeah. Well, the way I like to, the reason why I like an umbrella uh, term like that, and I think, you know, if you think about metabolic syndrome, just for those who you know, maybe need to understand, we, we kind of combine uh, elevated blood pressure, uh, elevated blood glucose, uh, elevated uh, triglyceride, which is the fats that float around in your blood, uh, a low HDL, which is always called the so-called good cholesterol. And we look at the waist or circumference, and I think it's 40 and uh, uh, 40 centimeters or so for uh, men, and 35 for women. Um, so the bottom line is this. If you look at those factors and you have three out of uh, five that are uh, abnormal, you have metabolic syndrome. Now, the key is this, um, and I think that's inches, not centimeters, right? I think that's inches, but um, even a doctor has to double check. <laughs> So, because a lot of times my medical assistant's measuring this stuff for me. But yeah, the point is, it is in the States. Yeah, that's right. Just wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. yeah, I just want to make sure. So, now, having said that, um, imagine if you just treat your blood sugar, right, with your diabetes medicine, right? You're only dealing with one of those factors, right? right. And what we found is that if you do things like a low-carb, high-fat diet or intermittent fasting, exercise what you're doing is you're attacking all of those things why do you even care you care because um there's a ton of medical conditions that are under this umbrella of metabolic disease for example heart attacks stroke dementia i mean polycystic ovarian syndrome mm -hmm. uh migraine headaches uh you start looking at the list of conditions, you could argue that 70% of all chronic diseases or more are related to metabolic syndrome. So if you, so if you then say, uh, all I have to do is reduce uh, the sugar and starch, that'll be helpful. Why, you know, let's do that. The question is, what is why, what's, what's the correlation there? Well, um, <clears throat> the, the, the thing that seems to be correlated with metabolic syndrome is insulin resistance and 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 you have insulin resistance because you are putting in your body the things that make you produce insulin so so what you want to do is say if i stop over if i reduce the demand for insulin in turn what will happen is my insulin resistance will get better so the best way to correlate that is uh, alcohol, you know, uh, tolerance. So if, you, if a person is a person who has a tolerance for alcohol, that's because they drink a lot. So what you do is you stop drinking as much. It's not easy to do that, but you stop drinking as much. And then what happens is... I, I know, I'm half it, Irish. What? <laughs> I'll pray for you. 
<laughs> yeah, I have that under a, control. I have an area near my home where it's an Irish area, and I see a lot of bars, so I hear you. <laughs> I, 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 can, I, can, I, can, I can definitely go <laughs> there myself. But, uh, That's right. So, so as a, at, when a person reduces their alcohol, like if I, I don't drink much, you know, I, sometimes I do, but when I do drink, my, I can, one drink will make me, you know, feel something. Then I have people in my family who will drink five or six drinks and they barely, you barely notice they've been drinking. So what we're trying, but, but in order for their, you know, they don't have alcohol resistance, they have to reduce their alcohol. And for a person that's trying to reduce their chance of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, what they do is they reduce the things in their diet that make their insulin spike, sugar, starch, and grains. So, so and all of a sudden you can then reverse this metabolic syndrome which is the cause of 70 plus percent of the chronic diseases we suffer from. So you get a lot of bang for your buck by focusing on metabolic syndrome. That's why what, even on my website, drtonyhampton.com, I actually, uh, my whole focus is metabolic syndrome. And the, and the things that are listed on my site, and I, I use the acronym nesting rope, those things all together are the root cause of metabolic disease. So my whole purpose on the planet now is to help people understand what are those things that cause metabolic disease and which do I have gaps in and then which do I need to focus on? So if, for example, if it's a relationship, which is the R in a rope, right? If my relationship is not healthy, that's going to create stress. And then that stress is going to lead to cortisol and that cortisol is going to lead to sugar production. And that sugar production is going to cause inflammation and fat storage. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, let's just work on, 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 the, on the, the cortisol. Now, we need to work on a relationship. That's the root cause. Mm -hmm. So if I can get the relationship under control, then I have a path. And then if that's good, if my relationship is healthy, then maybe I look at the rest of these root causes. And then those are the things that we do. And, those, and the good thing about that and we're going back to that elephant. We're talking about elephants a lot today. We can take one little bite off the elephant if I spent 15 minutes with my wife or my husband talking about, okay, we read the five love languages or Gottman, G-O-T-T, yeah. you know, his book on principles of marriage. And we spent 15 minutes a day on our relationship. That's all it was. But that could be a huge win for your metabolic health because if your relationship is making you sick, now all of a sudden you're making a relationship better, which won't make you sick. So, so that's kind of how you want to do it. You want to keep it simple and you want to take bite-sized pieces and you'll be shocked that that's all the greats, the, the great comedian we spoke about earlier. That's mm -hmm. all they do. They just take bites that other people are not taking. And then yeah. all of a sudden they stand out as one of the greats when they're not really great. They just do things that people are not willing to do. They put the time in. That's yeah. all. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing. And uh, it's, it's great to see a doctor like you who's putting the time in to learn and to communicate with these, with these great metaphors and so that you can reach the general public, you know? And, yeah. uh, and speaking of metaphors, do you have any other, other useful metaphors that, that you might use on a common, you know, as a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Come yeah, um, I, I, um, I know I'm always trying to um, inspire my kids and I, uh, you know, I learn the good thing about uh, knowledge is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So my kids and um, I remember we talked previously about my, I'm going to show you something that, uh, I was, yeah, show us the app. Your, well, yeah. Your this is something, something I have to show podcast. this with my, is that right? my son. Yeah. My son, if I can put this in front of you guys, yeah, this, absolutely. this, this image is what is, 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 is black rhythms, right? Uh -huh. So, um, my son is a, uh, kid at Wash U. He's in a master's program, right? So when you see this image, uh, he'll release his podcast probably uh, shortly after this is seen. And Black Rhythm, so he's going to talk about Latin American culture. Uh, but in, in his, one of his first one or two episodes, he talks about what we, we made them read the book, the, uh, 
uh, this, uh, the the uh, the book about uh, well, one of the things in the book was to seek first to understand, the, then be understood. Um, and I'm trying to think of the name of the book right now. It slipped my mind, but but so what 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 I taught my kids is as you go through life, you have to see the world through the lens of others. So as a physician, um, I have to I have to see where my patients are, what their struggles are. And I have to see the world through their lens. As a husband, I need to do that with my wife as a, as a, you know, when you think about all your roles as a medical director, uh, I have to see the world through the lens of my medical assistant, my uh, front desk person. They're people, they have families. And so what happens is, when you do that, then you'll, even, even the president of our country of the United States, I try to see the world, you know, why is he the way he is? Well, if I understand, uh, you know, how was he raised? You know, what kind of experiences did he have? And what happens is it allows you to then know how to better help people and know how to better understand them. And then you can kind of get some understanding. We can work together now. That doesn't mean you accept everything about people, but you understand them. So, so it's kind of a principle that I helps mm -hmm. me to, if I have somebody in front of me, I, when I, before I became board certified in obesity medicine, I would blame patients. Yeah. You know, they're not motivated enough. And I, and I didn't understand that some people had processed food addictions. Yeah. And I didn't know how to help them. Sure. So who do I blame, the patient? Or if they come into my office and I have a chair that's too small for them and they're embarrassed by that so they don't want to come to my office who do i blame the patient or do i blame myself but the, but only after i was able to see the world through a different lens um i think it was stephen covey that book he wrote about seven you know, habits perhaps seven habits of effective people yeah. that's what it was thank god we got a computer <laughs> yeah, yeah. it eventually works right so my son who's gonna and what my son did is he, I modeled for him. He saw me doing something. He said, dad, I think I want to do a podcast, you know? And, and so, oh, that's great. so what we do is we model for people. And if you learn principles about how to be respectful and understand, see the world through other people's lens, seek first to understand and be understood, then you teach the next person. It could be your child. It can be your, your spouse. Be careful with the spouse, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but it could be, don't, don't be careful. But, uh, but the key is you can, make the world a better place because now you're sharing these these nuggets of lessons and and i think we'll all be better for it none of us have all the answers we're just trying to move towards our ideal state so so i think i learned from you uh dan you learned from me and uh you know we've already shared some things you know a book that you may read or i may read so those are the types of things we do so we can be better tomorrow and when you learn something you'll be using it probably within a week. It always happens. I don't know if that happens to you, Dan. I'll learn yeah, something. Oh yeah. And then a patient will come to my office with that exact need. It's almost like something from above. I don't know where it comes from, but it's amazing. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. That's it. Um, it, I thought about that. In fact, I, you'll, you will be, uh, you'll be happy to know. This morning, I was sitting, I've got some Ikea mats over here, like play mats. Uh, we do exercise on and my son loves to invent new jumping. He jumps off of my desk uh, onto uh, off my IKEA Chico desk. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't try that yourself. <laughs> you know, and uh, onto the mats and he loves it. It's uh, that's anyway. Um, so I made it. He was on my exercise bike and uh, and so I made a video and I was saying, listen, just first. So everybody knows I never you know, ob ob obligate my, or ask him to exercise, you know, it's all about, but he likes to follow my example and yeah. it's fun and he can do a few minutes. If he wants to do a few minutes, you know, that's great. I do turn the resistance down, you know, and, uh, yeah. and modeling. And so then I went downstairs, my wife needed something and five minutes later he came downstairs sweating and he said, Papa, you know, so he's, uh, my wife is Spanish, and uh, so he talks to me. And we speak. I speak all English, and he gets all Spanish with his mother. And anyway, so he says, "Papa, uh, I was doing the bike and push-ups and squats like you." 
And I was like, wow, that's the first time he told me that he'd done that on his own. He usually wants me to see him. And I was like, wow. And I gave him a big hug. And I said, that's great. I said, but, you know, you can do that when you, you know, just have fun with it. You know, just have fun. I'm glad you're having fun. Yeah, you're modeling for them. <laughs> even, even when I think about my son, uh, he minored in Spanish. So his podcast is going to be an English and a Spanish version. Ah, These kids are, these kids are killing it. Yeah, so so I think that's yeah they're killing it. They make us seem like we didn't learn anything. So we but if you model for your family, they will you'll optimize them, and they're going to be much stronger for the next generation and the next generation. So so I'm just excited for both of our kids and what they're what they're going to do with their lives. Yeah, I've got one thing. uh, I've got so many notes, but one thing that I we talked about last time that I think would be very interesting for people. Um, and for parents as well as for you know healthcare folks out there is the topic of, of motivational 